gracias Andy uh, por vuestra invitación. Es un placer, es un placer estar aquí hoy. Uh, es mi primera vez en Colombia. Yo creo que es una ciudad muy bonita, uh, con gente muy amable. <laughs> that, that, that'll probably be all the Spanish I can, I can do today. Um, but no, it, it's a pleasure to be here. Microsoft, this is a beautiful, beautiful office, beautiful setting. And, uh, and from what I gathered, some, some very interesting insights in the first. Um, ancient Greece, this is a temple. Uh, temples were used for many things, one of those uh, being that they, were, they actually acted as banks, in a, in a sense. They stored, uh, they stored money, uh, valuables, mostly for wealthy. Uh, not everybody had access to the bank. Uh, not everybody lived in the city. We had farmers, we had rural people, uh, so they could not access the bank. They had to do their best to, the number one priority was to protect their valuables and their money. We don't really think twice about it today. A lot of the money are tied up, back then were tied up in assets such as livestock, produce, and land. You still might have some gold coins or exotic jewelry you acquired in a barter. So what would you do with your money? Well, you would hide it. Uh, you would hide it in the ground, uh, and because I'm pretty sure there wasn't much of a rural police state presence, the estate was vulnerable to attack. Uh, this was not an ideal approach, but it was the only approach. Uh, today we don't have this problem. I mean, would any of us think twice about putting our money anywhere else besides a bank or in some sort of financial institution? You can transfer money, you can invest it, you can do things seamlessly because it's not buried in the ground somewhere. So why do we do this with data today? Why is it buried all over the, proverb the proverbial law firm backyard? Because we need to protect it, but we also need to use it as an advantage. Before we get into that, let me introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I consider myself a legal technologist. <laughs> uh, I started as a lawyer. I had six years experience in e-discovery, and I've since then had about seven years in big law IT. What is a legal technologist? Well, it's not as much building technology or designing technology. It's using technology in the right way and adopting it. We'll hear later today about the tools that are at our disposal today in the modern market, but the tools are only a piece of the pie. We need a framework. We need some sort of governance. We need a vision, and we need trusted advisors. Think about a rice maker, or at least for myself. Uh, I can never make rice the same way every time in a pot, right? and it takes a lot of time. But I have a rice maker that makes it the same way every time, and it takes very little work for me. But if I don't use it, uh, I have inconsistent rice, and I'm out about $100, right? So a couple of things I want to talk about to set the stage is what exactly is the cloud? Show of hands. Who has a good sense of what the cloud is and really how it works. Okay, a few of us, okay, that's good. Uh, cloud computing, it's an awe-inspiring term, right? Uh, we look up at it in all its majesty. Uh, we look, we need an airplane to go into the clouds, right? <laughs> so what was meant by the clouds? Clouds are not only large and far away, but they're very mysterious. You lose objects in the cloud. When there is a thick fog, you cannot see very far in front of you, and nobody can really see you. The term and symbol of the cloud goes back to the 1970s. 
to describe pre-internet systems and telecom. It's a metaphor for a massive network of computers. Computer services are being accessed, but nobody really needs to know about how it works. This is a telecom diagram, a schematic from 1994 uh, that shows how the transfer of data will work. And what do we notice here? We notice the network. We're just gonna tap in <clears throat> to the network, this big blob, right? We don't know what's, what it's in it. We don't know how it works. We don't need to know, right? But it looks awfully like a cloud. A few years later, a defunct computer company devised the term cloud computing that was Compaq. It didn't really take hold of anything uh, until about 10 years later when companies such as Microsoft uh, picked up on the term and the business model and made it what it is today. So I wanna talk a little bit about, before we can talk about working in the cloud, we need to know a little bit about what the cloud is. All of these are services that you can purchase today. The first being the infrastructure. The infrastructure is the backbone of the service, provides your network connection, your storage, your computing power. We have the platform. These are kind of the guts of the ecosystem. The data and the processes that feed your applications. This is where data flows and integrations take place. This is also a service that you can procure. And then software, probably the most familiar. These are your sensory organs, I would say. This is where you generate work product, communicate, and research. And you connect through your endpoints, your mobile devices. Everybody's connected all the time today, right? But if I work in the cloud, am I assigning the role of security to a third party? And I would say partially, yes and no. So why the cloud? Security. Let's be clear, the number one threat to your data are humans. Your own employees, people who have access to the data. It requires training and awareness. Phishing attacks are only getting better, and so the best defense is training. Be proactive and keep your staff educated on the perils of working digitally. When it comes to the technology applied to security, the biggest tech giants in the world are investing tens of billions of dollars. It would be a silly question to us if we were deciding whether to bury our money or to give it to Bank Columbia to manage. As a safeguard alone, this doesn't seem like a question at all, yet we make this choice with sensitive data every day. But be careful. You may be looking at a software application that is hosted in Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services. That alone is not enough. Each cloud layer plays its own role in security. We'll talk a little more about this later. Working digitally allows us to innovate. We'll probably hear a lot more about this later today. But what does it mean to innovate? Not going to try and answer that question. <laughs> it's used in all various ways. But I'll take you through a few things that you can do the more that you start to accept that the cloud is the future of working. Efficiency of operations. So put simply, it reduces your operational overhead. Less maintaining of hardware, which depreciates over time. It's like a car, you buy a new car, you drive it off the lot, it's worth significantly less than when you purchased it. Less people, whether internal or external, are being paid to manage, stand up your data infrastructure. More resources can be spent analyzing the data for business purposes. The cloud also gives us flexibility anywhere, anytime. 
Your money, if it's buried in the ground, is not very flexible. There's nothing you can do with it. If your data is stored on your own servers or just on your computer, it's not very easy to share. And sharing knowledge and data is fundamental to what we do as lawyers. So why make it harder? Scalability is key to innovation. You've been instructed on a large case. There will be a lot of documents and you would like to try some cloud-based collaboration software. Assuming you have done your due diligence with regard to security and you have signed the contract and paid your deposit, you can be up and running in no time at all. And when you're done with that product, you can decommission and stop paying for it. It's also available. Uptime is very important. Your software service providers have many clients. It is in their best interest to keep the software up to date and online. At your bank, you can access your money at any time and move it around as you please. Same thing here. I'm not saying cloud solutions will never break, but the responsibility will be on your software vendor. And your contract should clearly state the service level agreement which is not, if not adhered to, should provide you with some protections. And then lastly, performance. Good software providers are current, are always modifying code and streamlining process and add, while adding new functionality. Again, they have the resources and incentives to do this. And then naturally it leads to the economics. Some of you may know where something like this resides in your firm. It's a rack of servers. Spend less on capital investments. In hardware, the people to maintain it, as well as the software installed, and spend more on security, internet connectivity, and modern devices. Use it as a differentiator. Pitch to your clients how you run your business, because your clients are typically willing to pay for legal advice. What they don't want to pay for are administrative tasks that are no longer necessary with the tools available to us today. So plug in to the cloud and continue to practice the law. Now, It's all good and well. We can, we're on the yellow brick road, we're headed to the Emerald City. Everything is, uh, is easy from here, right? Well, the problem is we still are holding very sensitive data. I often get the question at Clifford Chance from associates, why are our systems so bad? I have friends, they work in Silicon Valley and they use the latest and greatest software and I say, well, they don't work for large corporations and financial institutions and hold very, very sensitive and crucial information. It's very difficult today with young lawyers and explaining this, this difficult regime. So we need to continue to invest for the legal market. Otherwise, we're going to lose talent. But there are some considerations that we must make. I'll call them the three C's. So I'll pull a little bit from the ethics opinions from the United States. Uh, I would be eager to hear from, from you uh, how you view the ethical considerations here in Colombia. There's confidentiality. Very important to this, the competence that you have as a law firm and as a lawyer and the communication that you must have with your client. So I'll pull from the California Evidence Code. Confidential communication between client and lawyer for purposes of application of the attorney-client privilege includes disclosure of information to third persons to whom disclosure is reasonably necessary for the transmission of the information or the accomplishment of the purpose for which the lawyer is consulted. So we 
accept that we are using third parties, that the law firm will, and the client will not be the only archive of information. We have to, in order to innovate, and under, in order to be commercially successful and viable. So we really accept that, that this is something you actually must do. Let's talk about competence, though. Whether a lawyer to a party, this is from the New York State Bar Ethics Opinion, whether a lawyer to a party in a transaction may post and share documents using a cloud data storage tool depends on whether the particular technology employed provides reasonable protection to confidential client information, and if not, whether the lawyer obtains informed consent from the client after advising the client of this. So what is this really saying here? That we accept that we are going to use the cloud and we're gonna to continue to use it more. And that we have a responsibility to ensure reasonably that this is a secure, acceptable environment. So, wow, that, that says a lot because it's, it's comfortable today when you're storing data in your own, on your own site, you have your own firewall, you have your own people, um, you feel like you have some control over that. When you're handing that over and outsourcing to third party providers, uh, it can make one nervous, right? That's, these are reputational risks. Or these are critical to the survival of a law firm. So we, we need to build capabilities in order to do this. And I understand we have lawyers from small law firms to very large law firms. So that's gonna look a lot different for each type of organization. Some of us can afford a clipper chance. We have many, many people, probably too many people, <laughs> who have their hands in this. Um, but there are consultants out there for those who can't employ full-time resources. Now, I would argue though, as we move and shift from an infrastructure heavy organization to a lighter on-demand environment, we can shift the talent to address the modern concerns. Okay, so it's very important. It's not just that the technology is necessary. It's important that we have people who can speak to it. And there's another component to the competence here. This is from the ABA American Bar Association model rules. To maintain the requisite knowledge and skill, a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice. And here's the vital piece including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Engage in continuing study and education and comply with all continuing legal education requirements to which the lawyer is subject. So not only are we expected to be risk conscious, we are expected to be moderately aggressive from a strategic standpoint in implementing these new ways of working. Because why? Because if we continue to work as we do, it's going to cost our clients money. Our competitors will implement these new regimes and you're going to have a hard time selling your fees to the client when you're working this way. So it will either hit the client's pocketbook or it's gonna hit yours. But either way, it's not ideal for the future. A very important piece of this is communication. Communicating with your client, on, I know on many levels, is, is very important, and, and I don't know if we're always that great at it, right? I think sometimes we're focused on the work, we're not as focused on the client experience. So tell your clients what you're doing. If you're going to move into different data regimes, and you're going to try new types of technology, tell your clients about it. It's a great business development piece. Get ahead of it. You don't want your clients coming to you and saying, I heard from 
law firm X, they're doing this. What are you doing? So be prepared. And there's some things that you can do to do that. But this will help if there, if there ever is an issue down the road, being honest and open up front with your clients will help mitigate those risks. So how do we actually do it? What can we take away today and actually start implementing in our own organizations? Strategy. How many people in the room, show of hands, are part of the strategic vision of your firm and the strategic implementers? Okay, we have a few here. All right, so this is about the business operations. How are we going to move forward in the future? Uh, I, I hope we all know and why we're here today is that technology is a vital component of that. So we need to press forward. So we need to have leadership involved. If your leadership isn't on board, I can tell you I've been at a few different firms. They put the nice marketing material out there. They say we're doing all fancy stuff. Um, it's not necessarily happening in reality. At Clifford Chance, I can say one of the reasons why uh, I went there was that it actually had a top-down vision and it put a lot of money, it is putting a lot of money into innovation and technology and security. So you have to have the leadership there. You need risk at the table. How many people in the room play a risk role within their organization? Okay, yeah. These are your safeguards, right? They're your guardrails. You need them to help ensure that the innovations you're putting in place are reasonable, but they can also not be very fun, right? Risk, uh, they're not fun. They, they want to suck all the air out of the room. <laughs> so you need technology in the room as well. How many organizations, whether it's you in the room or someone that you work with, how many organizations have a technology voice in the room with the strategic partners. Okay. For those of you in the front, I don't think I saw a hand on that. I may have seen one on that. All right, so that's not surprising, but you need a technology voice. You need someone who can explain what is possible and what's not possible. And if they get out of line, then you have risk there to shut them down. But if you have technology people telling you no, you can't do things, I suggest you reevaluate who those technology people are. You want, you want to have aggressive, pioneering technology professionals in the room. Again, at my firm, we can afford to have this. We can afford to have many of them. Again, too many is not very helpful sometimes. Um, but for smaller firms, there are consultants out there you can procure services as needed to help address your strategic vision, to help put into context the principles of risk, and to ensure that you are staying up with the market, if not even ahead of the market, with the technology available to you. Getting everybody at the table is key, because what we're doing is we're bridging a gap between IT and the practice of law. So I started as a lawyer. I now work in IT. I'm at the very edge, the periphery of IT, under a cross-functional innovation umbrella. The most important thing I do is tell, translate technology to lawyers and translate the practice of law to IT. What I don't see happening a lot is that second piece. We assume the IT professional just do what they're told, keep the lights on. That used to work. That's not going to work anymore. You need to have a, you need to, to bridge the gap of the language barrier. IT people do not understand legalese. They, they don't. And, we shouldn't expect them really to on any deep level. 
And to be frank, lawyers don't understand IT speak that well. Okay, good. Uh, so we need to know what what is it. We're, we're it, it's when I started, we were it was it was make sure we have email, make sure the phones are running, make sure we have word processing, and you know pick up the phone when I call you, and I will tell you how we solve something. And today, it's I see it shifting a lot. I see a lot of change, especially where I'm working. I'm asked for my opinion. And I encourage you to do that with your technology professionals. For some of the larger firms, you have probably a few IT people. You might have somebody that's talented, ambitious, that's worth putting an investment into. You may have a lawyer that is really into the technology piece. Allow them the opportunity to, to spend time working with the IT professionals or the consultants you will be better for it. And you will have a trusted advisor who understands the practice of law and will be able to advise appropriately on IT decisions, technology, and data decisions. And your IT people will actually feel a part of the solution. Like I said, lawyers and IT professionals, we speak different languages. Uh, so building that common language is critical. Talk about the cloud, talk about innovation, data security, define those terms. What do those terms mean for you? Because it doesn't really matter what the word is if everybody has a different definition of what that means. So the only way we can do that is providing a seat at the table for those experts. Building a cross-functional capability that allows you to benefit from the power of tech, but also keeps you in line with your ethical obligations to your clients. Final thought. Let's try not to continue to store our data into the ground or in the wall or in a mattress, or in a piano leg, okay? <laughs> this is of no use to us. Don't put yourself in a precarious position. Get the right people in the room. Realize that you are no longer a law practice. You are also a technology company in the way that you deliver your services to your clients. Doing this, I promise you, will set yourself up for success in the future. Thank you very much for having me today. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy.